My name is Zoltan Pogaccia. I'll be the uh, host and the sort of debating partner of Brian Kaplan, who I like to welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, I'll say a few words about Brian at the beginning, and then uh, we'll have a discussion of uh, about an hour, I guess. Uh, after which, if, the, if you have questions, just think about questions while we speak. And if you do have questions at the end, uh, we'll give you the floor, and you get a chance to ask him uh, questions or just intervene in our little debate here. Uh, Brian is a well-known figure in the United States, and uh, we are hoping that he will become one in Hungary as well, having written on stuff which is really relevant for uh, Hungary in many ways. He is a professor of economics at, the, at George Mason University, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he has written on numerous topics. Uh, he's been to Hungary before debating... No. You haven't? Uh, that was virtual. Ah, I thought, yes. okay, because of COVID. Yes. Yeah, okay. Because yes. he, he was debating uh, government uh, people before, and I thought that would have been uh, personal, but actually then in that case uh, you were online. So it's your first time in Hungary then, welcome. Uh, he was debating... Uh, uh, Orban Balaj Orban on the uh, topic of migration, and uh, Brian has written a book on migration, so I'd just like to sort of wave this around if you're interested in that topic, uh, then uh, read uh, that this book. Uh, but we will not be talking about my, uh, migration today since he's already done a number of debates uh, in Hungary on that topic uh, and discussions. We'll be talking about uh, the economy and his views on the economy, um, mostly his libertarian views, what libertarianism is, uh, and some of the critiques of libertarianism. Uh, obviously, those of you who know Brian and those of you who know me will have realized that we are not uh, exactly at the same place ideologically. Uh, to put it mildly, actually, yet, 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 yet. <laughs> <laughs> there are always plenty of time. You're hoping that I'll convince you t today of uh, well, maybe of uh, well, he's obviously a self-professed libertarian. Uh, I am a self-professed green Scandinavian social democrat. Uh, so these are quite far apart from each other in terms of how we understand the world. But we'd like to use this opportunity to sort of demonstrate that two people who uh, are so far away in terms of their views of the world can have a peaceful and friendly discussion and hopefully a fruitful discussion about uh, what we think of the world. Uh, so that's why we're here. Um, uh, is there anything else I should say about you? All sounds good. Uh, okay, so in that case, we'll just jump right into the discussion. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm, a, I'm an economist, a university economist also. Uh, podcaster? No, podcaster, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, but I thought the most important thing about us would, ha would a a a in such a discussion be the sort of ideological gap mm -hmm. that divides us and, and, and why we are having this discussion. Um, I want to start and, you know, since, we, since I am on that topic of uh, an ideological gap, I want to start with your idea of a, an ideological Turing test. Because I think that uh, that is quite a relevant thing for Hungary. You'll, you'll tell us in a moment what that is, but uh, the reason why I bring it up is A, because it was a big thing in the States when you uh, debated Paul Krugman uh, on this issue, and B, because I, my experience is that in Hungary we have a lot of problems with not reflecting each other's ideas properly. So one, when we have public debates we tend to misrepresent, sometimes uh, by default, sometimes intentionally misrepresent the other side's views of the world uh, and your ideas on the so-called ideological Turing test would I think be very helpful. Uh, in uh, public discussions in Hungary. So first, I, I'd first like to ask you to elaborate what it is mm -hmm. uh, and tell us how you find it useful in public discussion. Uh, so small correction, Paul Krugman never responded to me, so I don't think we can really call it a debate. He said something, I said he was wrong, and then nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 
I would, I, if Paul, if you're out there, I'm ready. <laughs> and you'll, you'll see from this conversation that we can have a wonderful conversation, so I don't know why Paul would refuse me. Uh, anyway, uh, it all begins with Alan Turing, a man that you've probably heard of, uh, one of the founders of computer science. And he proposed a standard whereby you could test whether an artificial intelligence had actually achieved human level understanding. And what he said is, look, let's go and have an artificial intelligence, a computer in one room. Let's have a human being in another room. Let's not tell people which room has the computer, which room has the human being. And let's go and pass notes under the door. There will be a person to feed the note into the computer or in the other room, the human being will read it. And then you will see what the computer output is. You'll see what the human output is. And then to pass the, uh, the original Turing test, Turing said, it would need to be impossible for people to tell the difference between the computer response to a question and the human response to a question. All right, so that was the standard. Now, Paul Krugman did uh, give a few public talks where he said, look, here's the difference between a liberal economist and a conservative economist. He said, look, a liberal economist can explain not only his own views, but he can also explain the conservative views, whereas a conservative economist cannot explain the liberal views. Now, by itself, I was saying there's already a failure of understanding because there's almost no conservative economists in America. There are libertarian economists and there are, uh, there are liberal economists. The number of economists who would actually say I'm a conservative in America is really low, so say Paul is already stumbling by just not even using the right word. But in any case, my, when I reacted this way, I said, yes, but of course you could say Brian would respond this way and say, look, uh, no, no, it's me that understands you, Paul, and you don't understand me. I did have an argument where I said, look, since all of the top you know, PhD programs are run by moderate liberal economists, then to get a PhD from those schools, you must be able to understand the view that is taught there, whereas you don't need to be able to understand the other view to graduate with a PhD from Princeton or MIT or Harvard. Uh, but still, you could say, yeah, well, of course you would say that. So what I proposed was what I call the ideological Turing test. And this is one where I said, we're not going to just sit there saying, I understand you better. No, I understand you better. Instead, I said, how about we actually do a real double blind test where we see so one, you know, so one version is you go and you ask questions of me and Paul, and then Paul gives his sincere answer. Paul then gives the answer that he thinks I would give. I give my sincere answer. I then give the answer that I think Paul would give. And then we can have an audience of people, especially people that actually agree with Paul, people that agree with me, and see whether they can actually tell the difference between Paul's version of Paul, my version of Paul, Paul's version of me, my version of me. And notice this is an actual honest to goodness test where people do not know what the right answer is until they actually give their answer, which is a great way of keeping people honest. It's one thing to go and, say, and wait for things to happen and then have a person say, oh, I was confirmed by events. Anyone can say that. It's another thing for someone to definitely, before you get the information, to say what your, what your answer is. And then we can, in a neutral and objective way, say whether or not a person actually was able to correctly predict which answer was mine, which answer was Paul's. Now, this is a high effort standard. You really have to actually do go double blind. You have to observe standard experimental protocols. But you can do a lower quality version of this where you just at least try to go and explain another person's view that you don't agree with in such a way that it would be acceptable to a person that doesn't agree with it. I did a version of this at the Oxford Debate Society this summer. I taught summer school. And what happened there was that students were about to go, you know, they had some time to go and talk to people who disagreed with them. And then at the very key moment of the debate, we flipped a coin and either you would have to argue your sincere view or your insincere view. The truth is that since it was other kids at the same summer school, people often knew what your view was. So it wasn't a hard test. But nevertheless, not everybody knew. And it was an exercise where you wanted to explain the, uh, a view that you did not hold in a way that would be acceptable to someone that actually did sincerely hold it. Right? In terms of what the value of this is, oh uh, well, uh, you may have noticed people often talk past each other in public debates. People say, oh, you fools believe this stupid thing. And they're like, mm -hmm. no. We do not believe that stupid thing. You believe that uh, believes this stupid thing. No, we don't believe that stupid thing, right? And 
That is not a very good way to have a discussion. It's very frustrating for all sides. Of course, it's especially frustrating when you hear your own view being misrepresented. Right? And the idea of the ideological Turing test is, in the best case scenario, to just solve the problem with, a high, with high effort. Uh, in the medium case scenario, it's just one where we try to do a better job and to consciously think, can I explain this view in a way that would be acceptable to the other side? Right? And you can, you can improve that a bit more where you start off with, all right, here I'm going to try, and then the other person says that's not quite right. And then you say, okay, well, what I'm hearing is I should improve it in this way. And then you could do what psychologists would call mirroring, where you basically keep talking to each other until finally, ideally, you converge. Obviously, a person could just refuse to converge and just say, no, you're such a fool. I can't believe, <laughs> well, I can't believe that after all of my effort to correct you, you still keep saying the wrong thing. But at least it is an effort to improve and a tool to improve. Um, you know, you know, as usual, for any tool, there needs to be at least some minimal presumption that the other person wants to do better yeah. and accepts that they might be wrong, yeah. at least wrong to the extent that they miss, or they're not explaining your view correctly. Um, you know, that's, in the real world, is basically the best you can do. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, the reason why I found this to be a good start to our discussion today is because we tend to have debates in Hungary. I'm sure you're not familiar with the quality of uh, Hungarian public debates, but it's deteriorated to such an extent that you almost never get a, not, not a, a, an accurate representation, but not even a near accurate representation of what the other side is saying. So, and it's not simply because we tend to live in sort of opinion bubbles, because that's a global phenomenon that uh, we don't understand the other side because we don't interact with the other side. That happens everywhere. And I think this would be a good way of uh, having to break through those bubbles because you'd have to understand, in order to represent the other person's view, you'd have to sort of uh, try to find out about the other person's view. So you have to make an effort to actually understand the other side. But also because there is a deliberate misrepresentation mm -hmm. uh, often to, uh, to try to put somebody into a corner where they, where they actually mm -hmm. not. Uh, and that happens a lot in Hungary. So that would be a very useful thing. Uh, of course, the, uh, the aim of politics is often very different from science. So effectively, what we're talking here about here is, is science, where the, uh, the ultimate aim is to try to find some kind of a truth or some kind of a, uh, a, a consensus on how things are. Uh, and if you're interested in that, then this kind of a discussion can be very useful and valuable. If you're interested in trying to sort of demonize the other, then obviously this is not what you're interested in. Uh, it does take a lot of time, I agree, uh, that if you do this, obviously in the sort of media world that we're in today, where you have, you know, three minutes or ten minutes for an, in an interview, it's almost, in it's effectively impossible, because it does take a lot of time and effort. So can be done everywhere all the time so it's a, so you need a sort of special setting to devote a lot of time to to to, to do like this but uh, but uh, but it, just the the idea if, it, if the idea is in your head that maybe you know you should be looking to try to understand the other side and and you do find very interesting things and for instance me having read your work uh, although as i say i i don't stand where you stand but you you, you having try to understand your thinking has already given me a lot of sort of impulses on, on stuff. Uh, and I hope it will give you some impulses as well. One of the, uh, uh, the areas, and I'll promise we'll go into the idea of libertarianism, but before we go into that, there's a, a one book which I found especially interesting. And since most of you in the audience are university students, I think this will be a quite, uh, uh, well, at least I presume, uh, I suppose this will be uh, quite relevant to many of you. Uh, you've written a book on the value of higher education, or to be more precise, the non-value of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, university education. You actually make the claim that higher education isn't as valuable or useful as uh, people make it out to be. So I'd like you to uh, talk a little bit about why you think that and uh, what made you interested in this and, and, and how you try to prove that uh, higher education isn't all that it's made out to be? So let me just start with what made me interested in the topic. Honestly, most of my ideas, I didn't think about them at all until I was late in high school or college. But education I've been thinking about since kindergarten. 
because it seems so strange to me. I, you show up at kindergarten and they tell you you have to study a bunch of subjects and most of us are like, well, why do I need to know this? What purpose will this ever serve? When will I use this in real life? When I would ask adults, they would just say, well, like you have to do well in school if you want to get a good job. And they say, well, that seems true. All the adults that I know that are, have good jobs did well in school. Okay, I'll try, but I'm still confused about why this works. So that was where I started. Now, as I got older and was paying more attention, I said, well, it seems like a lot of what's going on is that the material that you learn in school that you don't actually need to know in real life, the reason why it matters is because people judge you based upon your performance. Uh, it certifies you. You get a stamp on your forehead. What's a Hungarian for stamp? A stamp, like a bureaucratic Pecci. stamp? Pecciit. Pecci? Pecciit. Pecci? Pecciit. Pecciit. Pecciita. Right, a pecciita on your forehead. All right, it's easier in Spanish. A stampa. A stampa. Stampli. 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 All right. No, not stampli. Right. Stampli. Right. <laughs> stampli is something else. So anyway, <laughs> I used to be, so I did start thinking about this, and that was a lot of what motivated my own academic performance. As I said, okay, I have to do well in this subject just to get the grade, even though I'll never need to know it again. There were other subjects where I said, no, I really need to actually learn this stuff. This will come up later. But there are many subjects where I say, look, I just get an A in this class. That's our highest grade. And then I'll never need to know it again. But it will still matter for my future because of the stamp on my forehead. Once I got to college, I discovered that some much smarter people than me had already figured this out. Uh, Michael Spence had already won. I think he had already won a Nobel Prize for this work. No, I think it was a little bit later, actually. But he, uh, Michael Spence, the economist, he, uh, he proposed the signaling model of education, which said that a lot of the reason why education pays in the labor market is not that it gives you useful skills, but rather that it stamps your forehead as being a higher quality person who is going to be a good and reliable worker. All right. Now, from the point of view of a student, it doesn't really matter why education pays in the labor market. It doesn't matter why, uh, whether the reason is that it gives you useful skills or that it gives you a stamp. But it does matter from the point of view of society. From the point of view of taxpayers, it matters if education raises income by actually improving worker productivity or if just, it just raises it by giving stamps. Because if it's the stamp story, then you can't make a country rich just by putting a lot of stamps on people's heads. All that will happen then is what we call credential inflation, where the number of degrees that you need in order to get a good job just keeps going up to keep pace with all the degrees. If it really were giving useful skills, that would be a different story. You can make a country rich by making workers very skilled. You could not make a country rich by making workers very stamped. Right. Now, what is original about my book, and I will say this is quite different from what almost any other economist who is working in this did, is I said, look, this isn't just a fun theory. This is the theory that actually seems true. Theory that actually describes the real world to a very high degree. I never said in my book, in fact, I explicitly denied that education is all signaling. Several people said, you say it's all signaling. I said 20 times, not all, but a high share. My preferred number is something like 80% of the payoff for education is from signaling rather than from learning useful skills. Uh, but in the book, I just put a lot of time trying to convince people that the signaling story is the better theory that fits the facts some of the main arguments that I use. I mean, I, normally this would be a talk of an hour, but some of the main arguments to start with the curriculum. Look at the subjects that you have to learn and compare it to the jobs that you are likely to actually have that would use those skills. Uh, for example, in the United States, it is standard to require three years of foreign language instruction in high school. As you know, Americans speak no foreign languages at all after three years of study. Right, except for immigrants. Immigrants do speak foreign languages, but other than that, virtually no American learns a foreign language in school. We don't even know enough to order in a restaurant. But if you just refuse to do it, or if you fail those classes, you probably cannot go to college in America. Right? It is, a, uh, it is, it is just a, a hurdle that you must endure in order to get ahead. So what is the value of speaking 1% of a foreign language? Like, what job could you get speaking three words of Spanish? Like, none. And yet it's three years of your life. That's very odd. Uh, but the same goes for many other subjects that are standard in school. So how many jobs are there in history? There's history teacher. All right, what other jobs? 
there's almost no other jobs in history, and yet again, you, uh, very common that you have to do three or four years of that, three or four years of civics, three or four years of science, higher mathematics. And on the other hand, you can look at subjects that people rarely study in school, like even today, computer science, rarely taught. Much more useful than calculus, or so, for example, but nevertheless, barely taught. Statistics, much more useful than, you know, than trigonometry. Trigonometry, much more taught than statistics. So this is one puzzle that there is such a chasm between what skills you actually need to know and what skills you actually are taught in school. Right? And yet we can see very clearly that education uh, does strongly predict higher earnings. So it does seem like education opens up occupational doors. It's just that you learn how to do the occupation after you get the job. Right? You know, the, the slogan that I have in my, uh, that I, well, not really in the book, but afterwards I say is, people often think about education as job training. Say so really it is more like a passport to the real training which happens on the job. Right? Some other signs that signaling is very important, at least in the United States. Uh, I, I know of zero research on this for Hungary. Maybe you know, but I know about it anyway. For the United States and other countries that have been studied, what you'll notice is that a very large share of the payoff for education comes from graduation year. You can do three years of college. How long, how long is college in Hungary? Is it three years or four years? Four. What is it? Four. Four, okay. Like in, the, in England, it's three. Right, but anyway, you can do three years of college in the United States and see almost no effect on your earnings if you give up. Then you do the last year of college and there's a huge increase in your earnings. Right. If every year was giving you useful job skills, this would be very hard to understand. On the other hand, if we are saying we have a social expectation that you finish, complete the four years, this is what our society expects of you, or you're someone that conforms to what society wants or not, if that is the story, then it makes sense that that last year could pay an enormous amount. Yes, you could have a weird theory like we don't teach the real skills until year four and then we just give you a lot of skills in year four. No one who's been through the system believes that. So that is again another, another odd thing that's called the sheepskin effect because it used to be the diplomas were printed on the skin of sheep and that's why it's called the sheepskin effect. In other countries that it's been studied, in England you get the sheepskin effect in the third year. Hmm, weird. All right, uh, so that would be another example. Now in terms of what this means for you as an individual, very little. Uh, but for what it means for you as a, someone who's thinking about education policy, it does matter a lot. It means that just going and spending more money on education is not a good development strategy. And again, there actually is a whole literature where they are very puzzled. Why is it that we see so little effective education on economic growth? Right? And there are a number of stories, but the simplest one is, yeah, my story. Like, yeah, within a country, getting more education is a way to, for you to show that you are better than the competition and to get a better job. But it is not a way to go and make a country rich because most of what is taught in school is not actually practical or useful in the real world. Um, now, many people have reviewed my book and said, well, you, you are a typical economist who thinks that the only reason for education is to get a better job. But what you don't realize is many people are in school for other purposes, to enlighten themselves, to, get, you know, to enrich their understanding of the world. Right? And my reply to this is, look, I can understand reviewing a book you haven't read. Everyone's done that, right? But to review a book where you have not read the table of contents, that seems to be a very low, a very low bar. I do have a whole chapter in the book very clearly labeled on the table of contents about other reasons to get education besides to get a better job. So I do talk about this. I am, I am aware of it. And there what I say is, again, um, no, no blame, but what is the evidence that it actually happens? What is the evidence, for example, that making students study classical music causes, a, causes love of classical music? What is the evidence that making students read poetry causes love of poetry? I say there the evidence is actually quite strongly that there's almost no effect because almost no one likes classical music in America anyway, and almost no one likes poetry, probably almost anywhere on earth actually. Do they make you do poetry in Hungarian school? Yes, yes all right. 
Well, some people had to do it. <laughs> the bitter people <laughs> had, to, had to do it. Um, so now I also say that I think it's quite clear that actually if education were known to have no economic benefits, I think there'd be very little interest in doing it because people, most people just do not appreciate these other effects. I'm of someone who actually really does enjoy German opera, for example. Right? Uh, but I'm also mo modest enough to admit that hardly anybody does. And just because I like it doesn't mean that it is a good use of taxpayer dollars to try to encourage people to appreciate something that we know hardly anyone will appreciate. Okay, so there's, uh, there's so many ways to react to this. I don't know which, uh, one, which line to uh, pick up. Uh, I, I, I do uh, recognize what you're trying to look at here. And I guess anybody who's been to a university mm -hmm. will recognize it because I think a lot of us mm -hmm. have had this experience that... Except a few dogmatic economists who just say I'm totally wrong. There, yeah, are, there, uh, <laughs> there are some people who just say no, wrong. Well, there might be, but I, I guess most people who are... Uh, you know, uh, at university today or have recently been to university mm -hmm. will recognize this problem that you have to study a lot of stuff which doesn't seem to uh, make much sense from the a point of view of, you know, what you're going to do later or when once you go into the labor market, mm -hmm. you, you, you think back um, and you realize that most of the stuff that you were learning at university had nothing to do with real life. So I do, I do buy that. Um, when you say this makes you skeptical about the, uh, the, the value of higher education. Uh, my reaction would be, yeah, okay, if this is the case, let's look at, um, let's look at faculties one by one, because it might be very different from one place, uh, uh, in one profession and uh, different in another profession. So I guess if you're a, I don't know, a, 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 an aeronautical engineer and you don't know what you're doing, then that causes a, a, a slight glitch quite early in your profession that you've not been trained well enough to actually you know, design aircrafts. And I suppose that comes back at you sooner. Whereas if you're, a, I don't know, I don't want to pick on any other profession, but there are some professions where the sort of uh, in, you know, reaction or the sort of re, uh, um, uh, what's the word the, um, uh, the 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 effect of on your job is not uh, not quite uh, as as obvious. Uh, so what I would do at this point is I'd examine every single course, every single university, and sort of try to assess to what degree uh, these. Uh, university courses actually prepare you for real life and if, if they don't then just improve it so rather than just you know throw it out and say well it doesn't prepare you try to improve it but it's a fair point I I, I, I you know I, I read this as a fair criticism of what we're doing at university but more interestingly uh, from a left-wing point of view what it does remind me of and when you say a lot of it is actually signaling can you say you believe 80 percent of it might be signaling uh, that's not so far away from what left-wingers would actually say about universities, that universities to a large degree are not really about substance, they're about social connections. Mm -hmm. That the reason why you're there in the first place is because you come from a milieu where uh, your path to university has already been paved. The most people, especially in the United States, the people who go to university go there because they come from a certain class. Uh, also in Hungary, I would say today it's the same thing. Uh, and what you're doing there is you're actually, I mean, the, the author that comes to my mind when I read your work is Pierre Bourdieu, the French mm -hmm. uh, sociologist, who basically said what you're creating here is social capital, symbolic capital. Uh, this is the sort of hidden latent, latent agenda of our societies today, that the reason why you go to university is, you, is to get that stamp on your forehead that you have actually been to university. There have been studies which suggested that people go there to, 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 to find a marriage partner, hmm? the right kind of marriage partner, because those people go there who you want to marry. Uh, so it's basically more of a social, I mean, people who've gone to Oxford or Cambridge will talk about this. Uh, quite openly that most of the time they actually spend socializing with each other uh, and the reason why you go there is because you want to be part of the British elite. So t your criticism from a right-wing point of view seems to be very similar uh, to criticism from a left-wing point of view which criticizes the university more as a kind of social institution rather than as a, as a technical institution for training. I wonder what you think about that, that sort of all right. parallel. Wow, great questions. Mm -hmm. All right, so first of all, 
Obviously, you know, not every department or not every discipline is going to have the same share signaling. Although one of the main things that I've learned in talking to people in many fields is that if a field is hard and sounds vocational, we tend to assume that it's all skill-based. Yet when you talk to people in the field, they will often say, no, wrong. Actually, we do. there's a lot of stuff that we had to learn that is not relevant in the real world. My dad is a PhD in electrical engineering. What do you think that he did in graduate school primarily? Proofs. He did proofs. How many theorems did he ever prove once he actually had a job in aerospace? None. Right. And so then how did he learn how to do his job if during his PhD they kept making him do things that were not very related to what he had to do? And the answer is, again, the PhD got him the job, and then on the job they taught him how to actually do it. It's true that he did learn some useful things. He knew that he had the basic math background, the basic concepts, but the amount of time that he had to waste doing things that really were just not relevant. Even computer science, actually, so I don't know how it is in Hungary, but in the United States, there's actually two different majors. One is called software engineering, where they actually teach a lot of detailed practical skills about making software. The other one is computer science, where you often spend a lot of time studying pure theory, which is not actually relevant to, the, uh, to writing software, according to my friends that have done it. And yet, the CS degree is the one that actually pays better and is more prestigious because people think of it as the hard one. It's the one that like a real macho computer programmer will do. So yes, while it is while it's definitely useful to go and look at which ones are actually teaching useful skills, it is not a good idea to think that just because something sounds vocational and it's hard that it really is actually teaching skills. Another really good one is law. So in the United States, like, first of all, you have to do a whole undergraduate degree before you can study law. Is it like that in Hungary, or how does it work in Hungary? So you can immediately study, study law after high school? Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's another weird thing about the U.S. Is first, you have to spend four years studying something totally different, and then you can start law. All right, and like, there's a whole country where that doesn't happen, and we don't waste four years of people's lives. How can that be if our system is good? Like, our system is terrible, right? But anyway, even when you get to law school, do you know what you do in the first year of American law school? You study the law of 12th century England. That's what you do. Yeah, but you study <laughs> Roman law in Hungary yeah. as well. Yeah, all right, all right. So, well, you're not perfect either, right? <laughs> but, like, why? It's like, because we've always done it that way, because that's what's expected of you. You know, like, because like, that's like, where the principles come from. Come yes. from. Well, that's, that is the excuse that they give, although often the principles that you're taught are just wrong. So, like, you know, my wife, when she did securities law, at least there was an improvement. In the 1990s, they taught her the securities laws of the 1970s, only 20 years out of date. Then she gets the job and they say, don't use what you learned, that would be malpractice. Right. Uh, right. Like, okay. What you learned is incorrect. But uh, so, anyways, now, the solution of, look, let's, like, let's just fix the system. That sounds great, it's, and, and that is one of the most common answers that I get to, uh, for, you know, uh, to people, especially when I talk about cutting spending and doing less. But why? So we, like, here's what I'll say. Uh, imagine that you've been spending money on a gardener, and then you discover that he's been taking your money for decades and has not done any gardening. He just keeps taking the money, and then you say, wait a second, you've been, you haven't done the gardening, you haven't done your job, you've taken my money, and it's, all right, look, all right, fine. Uh, I'm going to improve. From now on, I'm going to actually do gardening, but keep the money coming. Right? I think you would reasonably say, no, you have proven yourself highly untrustworthy. And at, at the best deal that you, that gardener gave us, how about you go and do my gardening for free for a while and, and convince me that you can be trusted. And then maybe I will think well, about doing this. They show you some very rude signs yes. at this point <laughs> if, you, if you ask them to do that. I don't think they're yes. they, they safe. Well, I th probably not. Mm. I mean, so like this is the way that I react to someone who says, all right, well, fine, we're failing to teach foreign language in America. Mm. Tell you what, we're going to figure out how to really teach foreign language, and then we're going to do that, but keep the money coming the entire time. Mm. And I will tell you what I'm almost sure will happen, mm. and that is they will not improve. They've been promising improvement for so long. Now, one possibility is that it's just too hard to do better. I actually do not believe that. I think that there are teaching techniques that would work, but they are painful. They require you to tell people that you have to work really hard, and, you, and also you have to tell people that they are not doing good. Teachers do not like this. So I don't know how Hungarian teachers are in America, or where Hungarian teachers are, but in America, teachers are very nice. 
They're, I, will, like, I will have a lot of criticism, but they're super nice. But they are not logical. They are not results oriented. How do you actually teach foreign language? Well, you guys all speak a foreign language, so you probably have an idea. Uh, but uh, first of all, like immersion, immersion, like, like you know, man kann hier kein Englisch sprechen, nein, nein, nein. That's how you teach German if you really want to teach German. You don't do it like we do in America where you say, okay, now we're going to learn some German. The Germans are a very interesting people who live in Central Europe. And their word for yes is ja. All right, let's go and ask questions and then say ja. Right, that is, that, this is not even a joke. This is how bad the teaching is. To go and tell that person we have a better method of teaching and we expect you to do it. Good luck. They just have a totally wrong attitude. You would have to fire the entire profession, basically, and replace them with people who actually are motivated. This just is not the way the government works, unfortunately. Um, okay, let's uh, go to, yes. the, to the second part. Yes. We need to right. speed up a little bit. Uh, really so, sure, you've written sure. so many yes. books, I want to discuss all of them. And if, uh, if, I'm happy to go along. <laughs> we're being too slow here. Uh, the other, the other uh, question I had about uh, the university being essentially a social institution. Ah, yeah, yeah, great question. So I completely agree with what you said. I actually have a whole post where I talked about left-wing lessons of my book, The Case Against Education. And I mean that post in all sincerity. Um, so yes, uh, I was very disappointed that I had very, a lot of trouble getting any left-wing audience to go and take the book seriously because I know I am saying a lot of what left-wing critics of education have said that you know, it's a method of social control and you aren't learning very useful things. Uh, the main thing that, that I will say is, uh, that I least think is overstated, is the idea that a lot of the reason why education pays is that you meet valuable social connections in school. This is true, I say, for certain disciplines. It's true for computer science at Stanford. There it really is true that you are making friends with people that are going to be billionaires in the future. That's a fantastic deal. But it's important to remember, at least in the United States, most majors are so distant related to any occupation that it is extraordinarily unlikely you'll ever work with a person that you met in your English class or in your communications class or in your psychology class or even in your business class. These are majors that are just so remotely related to the job market that your friend that you make argument, is probably just argument, useless to you. But the argument there is usually not that it's useful for the labor market. The argument is that mm. it's useful for networking. So mm -hmm. you start networking right at that age and then you continue to mm -hmm. network once you're out of university and those sort of networks So, so you, so you learn, learn how to network. Yeah, you self-perpetuate right. those right. networks from university. Right. That's the usual argument. Right. Well, you know, they're self-perpetuating where the people that you meet will be useful to you later in life. Mm. And that, I think, is only true for a small minority of people in certain specialized fields. Mm. Then there's the idea of you just get really good at talking to other mm. people. Mm. I mean, so this is a, a story that blogger Noah Smith had about uh, Japan. But anyway, I said, look, if this were true, then there were some number of interesting predictions that, as far as I know, no one has ever defended, such as there will be a, a large return to living in dormitories rather than living at home for college. I don't know if any researcher has ever claimed that this is true. No, but it the, could, the, be, the, could the, be true. No, but the, yeah. the, the examples that they always come up with is that uh, the British elite all mm -hmm. come from uh, Oxbridge mm -hmm. and they had gone to the same private uh, schools before. And mm -hmm. um, the American elite, a lot of the American, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. the political elite, come from the Ivy League uh, mm -hmm. universities. So they're, they're mm -hmm. and, and you know, they're, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Hungary's elite today, political elite, tend, tend to come from one specialized college. And they've been ruling this country for a very long time. And they actually went to one specific mm -hmm. college that they all studied together. Although uh, that oh, that's, uh, does sound like, sort of like Stanford Computer Science, right? Where they, get, they actually get to know each other, they get yeah. put into a social group. Yeah. And but you know, that's, have, that's different from getting, learning, how, learning how to be good at dealing with people, right, right. which is or just quite networking. a bit less clear. Okay, let's, okay. let's continue with your other book, because I found that also quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. You wrote a book on how effectively how democracy doesn't mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that voters tend to have certain biases about economics that mm -hmm. the economics profession mm -hmm. thinks differently. Can you mm -hmm. explain that sure. book to the Right. So there's the general story, which almost has to be right, and this just says that no individual voter has much incentive to get the truth. Right? Why? Because what are the odds that one regular voter will change an election? They're extremely small. It's extremely small. 
you, know, you could go and vote randomly and what would happen to you? The same thing that's going to happen to you anyway because you're just one little person. All right, so that is my general story about how voting is very different from shopping. If you shop randomly, if you just go to a store and start putting objects into your shopping cart, you are going to have to pay a pile of money for a bunch of stuff you do not want. Right? And if you had acted differently, you would have a better outcome. If as a voter you do the same thing where you just vote randomly or for whoever has the better haircut. What's the, what's the guy's name? Uh, let's see. Like Barash Laszlo? The guy like, like who's running for office in my, in my, where, in my, where my apartment is? The guy has a fantastic haircut. All right, I will give him that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know, you, what, what's his name again? Burris? Mm. Burris Laszlo? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, anyway great hair. Right? So you, like, imagine voters just made, uh, vote for whoever has the best hair or is the best looking, right? Then what would happen to them? And the answer is the same thing would happen to them anyway. Which means that, that democracy is not self-correcting. It does not have the same incentives to learn that you would have in a market where it's your own money and your own result that you control. Now, that is sort of the general picture that I have. I then make some more specific claims, which you don't have to agree with to accept my general story. So the more specific claim is I say that when people think about the economy, they think about it very emotionally. For example, there's a lot of resentment of markets. A very simple one is in America, we do not like to pay for parking. Right? In Europe, you have a much lower resistance to paying for parking. But for Americans, paying for parking is like prostitution. <laughs> All right, it's just like I can't pay money for this, like, and that just benefits the rich, and like only the rich should be able to park. And the, there's so much resentment against uh, against paying for parking, and as a result, it is very hard to park in American cities, right? Because many times we just have no price at all, and so whoever wakes up at five in the morning gets the parking space, and then anyone else just has to park five miles away from where they are. It's a terrible system, right? And I call this anti-market bias. Of course, the greatest example of anti-market bias is communism itself, where you create a whole society where you are trying to have to suppress markets and have government run the entire economy, right? And also with the dream of one day just having no prices for anything. I know in actual communism you did have prices, usually well below market prices, so that the money wasn't very worthwhile. And you had, like, because how bad was the queuing in communist Hungary? Was it was it very severe? Was it like, was, was it Soviet level or was it more yeah, moderate? It was worse. Yes, it was. Uh, Hungary know, was actually worse. Okay. No, that was yeah. worse. I mean, like yes. Soviet Union was definitely worse than Hungary, and probably like Romania mm -hmm. was a lot mm -hmm. worse than Hungary. Mm -hmm. So this was but, like the yes. rest, relatively the, the most liberal. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, countries. Yeah. So we right. had shortages yes. every now and then, but yes. uh, right. Yeah. So anyway, that's one more, example. More another, another thing I talk about is anti-foreign bias. Mm -hmm a tendency whenever foreigners involved to assume that there's going to be some horrible economic harm. The best example, of course, of anti-foreign bias is thinking that immigrants are bad, even though they are, in fact, economically great. We're not talking about immigration, but just to put that in, but also just general resistance to foreign trade. The idea that the best thing to do is to export as much as possible and import nothing, which is the basis of, all, of, of almost every trade treaty is, we'll accept your goods, yuck, if you accept our goods, great. Which again, if you just think about it, is a very strange perspective. Imagine a country wanted to give you all of your imports for free. They just, uh, there's another country that says, we want to work for Hungary for free. So, really? Okay. <laughs> that would be a more normal reaction. Now, I also in the book talk about other kinds of emotional reactions that people have. I talk about emotional views on toxicology. Like, Toxicologists have a very strong view the poison is in the dosage. It does not make sense to get really upset about a very low dosage of a toxin because the odds it will cause any harm is extremely low. And yet, people that do not study toxicology tend to have a categorical view. Any amount of a toxin is too much, right? Uh, and I think about this in terms of many other fields too, but yeah, that's my general perspective okay. on what's wrong with democracy is that there are these emotionally appealing views and the system is not self-correcting because you can, if, you know, if you go and vote emotionally, what happens to you is the same thing that happens to you if you vote reasonably. Right. Okay, well, uh, my reaction to this book are pretty similar to the, my reaction to the previous mm -hmm. book. Uh, first thing I want to say is that uh, I see your point. I think you have mm -hmm. a point there. I think this is generally felt in the world today that there are 
uh, serious issues with democracy all over the world. Um, I don't think there are too many people who would dispute the fact that in the last 30, 40 years, democracy has become a lot worse than it was before. And we do have a problem with the sort of ignorance of the voter. Uh, I think that's generally admitted. Um, whether you can actually deduce this from comparing it to economists, there I have a little bit of a concern because I felt that your um, assessment of where economists, you, you, I, I felt that you were trying to homogenize uh, economists a little bit. Knowing the economics profession, I think we are much more divided on most issues than uh, what would serve as a sort of basis of comparison. Uh, we're much more divided in terms of issues. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. give you just one brief example. Um, if you think about the issue of a minimum wage, mm -hmm. there are people who believe that a minimum wage is useless and should be thrown out of the window. You're probably one of those. Yeah. Counterproductive. Uh, uh, counterproductive, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And there are other people who believe that it's actually mm -hmm. vitally necessary in case of a crisis. Uh, real Keynesian, post-Keynesian economists would actually believe that. Uh, and that t tends to shift over time. So 30, 40 years ago, the, the, the larger part of the profession would have thrown the minimum wage out of the window. Uh, in the last couple of years, you've seen people win Nobel Prizes for uh, mm -hmm. proving that, that minimum wages actually work. So that single example, you might not believe mm -hmm. it, but they mm -hmm. have, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that well, they've given... It was my t-shirt. <laughs> the fact that they've given Nobel Prizes to people actually just shows you don't have to accept what they're saying, but the mm -hmm. fact that the profession is incredibly divided, I think, is, uh, is, 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 is proven by this fact. Uh, so to compare the rest of the population to professional economists and say, these guys here have a, homog uh, a homogenic view and the population believes otherwise, uh, I, I, I think is problematic because we're not, we're not homogenic. Uh, but more importantly, uh, when you have a problem with voters, um, the, the, my concern with going down this path is that you tend to end up with politicians who then say, well, let's restrict voting. Uh, we have a political party in Hungary which is advocating in this specific political campaign that we're in, uh, limiting voting. Uh, because they, ch they believe that there is a serious concern out there about not everybody being educated enough to vote. So once you, you go down that particular path and you say, well, a lot of people are too ignorant. And so the answer, my, my social democratic answer would be, well, okay, if people are not, if we believe people are not educated enough to vote, let's make them more educated. So we need a welfare state, we need a better educational system, and let's try to make sure that people understand what's going on in the world. Uh, my fear is that we go down the other path where you end up with politicians arguing that we should exclude a certain segment of the population from democracy because we see them as being too ignorant. Mm -hmm. What's your response mm -hmm. to that? So correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't Fidesz do really well with less educated voters? I mean, like, like you said, I know you were saying they do really well with rural voters, and less rural voters are highly educated mm. in Hungary, which would yeah. be unusual. Yeah, yeah, yes. they, they would probably do better with less educated voters. Then. All right, so in a way, it's you guys saying that things would be better if, <laughs> if fewer people voted, not me. Uh, but, you know, like, like here's the main, you know, like, you know, the answer of let's just educate voters and this will solve it. Look, you've had 100 years, it hasn't happened. So what are we talking about? Well, like even in countries, well, like so even in Scandinavia, you've had many decades of social democracy. You've had all the time in the world to go and try to go and improve people, and yet we just don't see it. I think my Why story. Do you say yes, Why yes. do you say that? Because mm -hmm. I would say that Scandinavia exactly mm -hmm. proves my point that they have the best mm -hmm. quality of democracy. So by by mm -hmm. any measure internationally, mm -hmm. uh, the only place where people mm -hmm. would still feel. I mean, there's this question mm -hmm. that I really mm -hmm. like where they ask people, "Do you believe that mm -hmm. the political system works mm -hmm. for you, or not?" And the only places globally where people actually mm -hmm. say that the political, the, 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 where the majority mm -hmm. still believes mm -hmm. that the political system works for them. Uh, or Scandinavia, Canada, mm -hmm. and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Singapore also. 
Singapore gets really high scores. Yeah, but it's not a democracy. Singapore um, is not. I'll a disagree with that, but uh, that's a di- diff- di- different different issue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, so what I'm trying yeah. to say is, here, well, uh, Scandinavia does mm-hmm. have a, 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 mm-hmm. a good quality democracy, yes. mm-hmm. uh, and that's probably, yeah. in my view, that mm-hmm. my understanding that's the mm-hmm. that's the end result of actually having a welfare state which spreads knowledge across the spectrum. Mm-hmm. The sort of uh, Achimoglu Robinson mm-hmm. or, or, uh, uh, argument about spreading mm-hmm. resources. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's good by the standard of people say it's good, and there's good by the standard of can they pass an objective test of knowledge. And by that one, I would be amazed if people in Scandinavia could do very well. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, am I homogenizing the economics profession? Actually, I think in the book, I spent a lot of time talking about, oh, yes, economists do disagree with each other. And that's precisely why I tried to focus on the, on the areas where there is agreement. I didn't talk about the minimum wage. Partly, it wasn't actually on the survey. But I tried to talk about things where there is a high degree of consensus, areas where Paul Krugman and I would have a lot to agree on, possibly where you and I would have a lot to agree on. Um, yeah, the market, yes. the market would definitely be one, be mm-hmm. one of those areas mm-hmm. where we, we would have disagreement. So, you so you'd, park, you'd, parking, should parking be free? Um, but you, you could make the well, argument that... Well, right, well what market, do you think? Yeah, do you really but, think but, park, but, should but, parking uh, be free? Yeah, but that isn't, that isn't it's, the market. It, 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 it's a big well, issue. Brian, a normal a, normal, normal Brian, Americans hate that idea Brian, very uniformly. Do you have, do you have uh, private yeah. parking companies mm-hmm. in the States? Because mm-hmm. in Hungary, what mm-hmm. we have is the local government, which mm-hmm. collects the... Uh, which collects the parking fees. So we have, yes, state. We have both. It's so so we, street parking is done by the government. Yeah. And then uh, parking garages, sometimes owned by the government, sometimes private. Same here. Yes. Same here. Same right. here, but the majority right. of pub, mm-hmm. but the majority of parking is actually the state mm-hmm. and not and not the private sector. Right, but, but just the question of you know, like so normal Americans at least I don't know about Hungarians mm-hmm. normal Americans like just the question should parking be free Yes, they love it. Well, this is and, not and, the market. And, 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 and under, 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 understanding the, uh, the well, Brian, bad, what bad I'm bad trying to say is this yeah. is not the market. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. not the market. The mm-hmm. the local government mm-hmm. pricing in. Uh, parking is not the market. It's a, it's it, a local. It's a, it's a state. It's a state. Uh, it's a state regulated fee. But it is an example of there being a consensus between left and right wing economists against the general public. Not so sure about it, but yeah. Yes. Okay, let's leave okay. it there. Okay, now let's go to the let's go to the actual topic because I think there's a lot of people. I just I wanted to use these two two books as first of all to get to know Brian because I think his books mm-hmm. are worth reading. Secondly, uh, to sort of approach the, the real issue, which is uh, libertarianism. Uh, and I want to spend the rest of the discussion talking about what you think libertarianism is and why you think it's, it's a superior system to, 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 to other stuff. So if you could define, mm-hmm. because many people understand mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. things under mm-hmm. the term, so I think it would be useful if you could start with you defining your version of mm-hmm. uh, the definition of libertarianism. So I think the best definition of libertarianism is it's a strong presumption, not an absolute presumption, but a strong presumption against against government action and in favor of private property and free markets, right? And of course, part of a big part of that is private property in oneself. So a key part of libertarianism is for adults, your body, your choice. That was briefer than I expected. Yeah. Uh, right. And uh, you know, like, and I guess like the, the best way to distinguish, you know, so many people say, isn't that just like American conservatism? And like, the answer is no, because libertarians actually mean it, and they mean it for areas of government where government is super popular, and libertarians will still say no. Uh, for example, like it would it'd be almost impossible to find any re- elected Republican in America who is against Social Security, which is our our government old age pension program, and say you know, libertarians often strongly oppose Social Security and say, look, this is just something that should be a saving for retirement, it's a private decision, it should be up to you, it should not be up to taxpayers to handle it. That would be one example. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, your definition of libertarianism is a bias towards yeah. private mm-hmm. as opposed mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. public. But mm-hmm. uh, the, the reason why I find it hard to go on with that particular definition is because it's, op- it's often a question of degree. Mm-hmm. To what degree yeah. you think this? Because you, you, you hear mm-hmm. people define themselves as libertarians who would keep a lot of stuff mm-hmm. uh, non private, mm-hmm. and then you, you, you see the kind of debates amongst libertarians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people labeling, yeah. well, you're not yeah. really a libertarian because yeah. you would you'd mm-hmm. keep the police and mm-hmm. you wouldn't want mm-hmm. to privatize the police. So, so I feel that before we proceed, we, it would be interesting or important that you would define your degree of libertarianism. Mm-hmm. So, what would you keep? 
mm -hmm. public, if mm -hmm. anything, and what would you privatize of mm -hmm. the stuff that we have in the public domain today? All right, so very different question. Mm -hmm. you know, you're absolutely right that it's very common in not just libertarians, for almost mm -hmm. anyone to go and say, this is the word and I'm not gonna let you share the word with me. Mm -hmm. I try to always define words sociologically where it's a, like, it's a word that captures mm -hmm. a large group of people who all use the word and I don't want to exclude someone just because they disagree with me. Uh, in terms of my actual views, I'll just start with popular things that I'm against. So I am against immigration restrictions. I'm um, against government regulation of housing. I think you should be able to build skyscrapers all over Budapest, right? And if you own a historic building, I think you should be able to knock it down and put a skyscraper there. Uh, that would be, you know, uh, and I am writing a book on this right now, so and, and like, you know, why that? Uh, because it turns out that's actually one of the most regulated parts of the economy and one where we have the most to gain by deregulating it. Let's see, other examples, yes, I am opposed to government funding of education. Right, all which, all yeah, yes, I, all yeah, yes, I, yeah, so, mm -hmm. uh, again, I would not be strongly opposed to having a small voucher program for poor kids, but I, but I'm at, but I would actually say that, mm -hmm. like, my first choice would be not even that, and private charity should mm -hmm. take care of that. Uh, let's see, I'm against government provision of health care. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, all yes, all yes. and again, if you think that's, uh, you know, like, you know, if you say, like, would there an exception you make? Maybe, maybe vaccine funding. That yeah. is the, the yeah. like, the strongest exception. Yeah. But yes, and by the way, if you think that America does not have government funding of health care, that's completely wrong. Uh, we, like, I'm almost sure that actually we spend more per capita on health care, government spends more per capita on health care than Hungary does. It's just that we waste our money, yeah. right? So we spend an enormous amount on health care, we just spend it very poorly. And therefore, we wind up covering a small percentage of the population and spending enormous amounts of money on each person and having no limits on what you can spend, and then everybody else is tough luck. Uh, so it's, we are especially inefficient, but it's not true that we don't spend any money on it. Uh, in terms of what ideally we should have, right? So I don't want to dodge the question, and even though it makes me look crazy, I'll say it anyway. Uh, so yes, I, I have many times said I am an anarcho-capitalist. I think the best thing would be if government were abolished and private property and the free market took over everything. I am told, I, now, I am not crazy enough to think this would make sense to most people. It's, this is the kind of view where I say it doesn't really make sense to even talk about it until you're convinced that government should be almost nothing. Once you're convinced government should be almost nothing, then you can have a, a fruitful conversation on this and then my view will no longer seem crazy to you. But as long as you are in any way in a normal view, then obviously my view is going to seem crazy. I mean, for example, if you think that, you de that it's very important to have government regulation of food safety, then when I say, well, reputation will take care of that, that's going to be completely unconvincing to you. On the other hand, if you're already on board for, yes, reputation is a sufficient, uh, a sufficient protection to for, for food safety, we don't need government to do that, then arguments that I would make would, would make sense there. But anyway, so if you're curious, I've written about this, but you know, I also make it my policy not to focus on, my, on the views that people will find strangest. I try to find views that are highly controversial and yet I think I can actually make some sense to a person that doesn't share a lot of premises initially. Yeah. So that is no, what okay, I focus good. I can, on. I, can, I can go along yeah. better with this because now you've basically said in ad extremum you would privatize mm -hmm. everything. Yes. Um, it's just straightforward, but um, then let's take an example. I think one mm -hmm. way of uh, discussing it would be to try to adopt this situation to mm -hmm. Hungary. Uh, mm -hmm. Would this make sense in Hungary in 2022? Mm -hmm. um, we have a country which is um, sort of, you know, mid-level developed globally, uh, not not particularly rich, but not particularly poor either. It's trying to converge. It's trying to uh, mm -hmm. catch up. The usual point of reference here is always Western Europe, not not mm -hmm. so much the States, but when, or, when Austria or Germany or something mm -hmm. like this. We're trying to catch up with them. Um, everyone realizes that the way to do this is through uh, human resources. So we probably agree on this, that uh, a key to... Uh, since you've written a book mm -hmm. on this and you, you argue mm -hmm. that you know human resources are crucial, mm -hmm. um, we would want a society where people are well educated and have good skills mm -hmm. and can contribute two to different the, things. Well, okay, I mean, take whichever you, whichever yeah. you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm it, pro skill. Let's try it. Okay, let's. I, I can yeah, I can yeah, go yeah. along with that. Well, let's say have skills. They can you know they're useful on the labor market. Uh, they can drive the economy, having that sort of a uh, you know human capital that you need for that. Um, 
how do you acquire that? Uh, you have in Hungary, we have uh, surveys which show that about four out of five households have zero savings. They literally don't have savings. So uh, my question to a libertarian in Hungary, I have debated mm -hmm. uh, Hungarian libertarians, my question's always been, what is your answer to the challenge of having to uh, upskill to fourth, fifth of the population who have zero financial reserves? And not only that, but they also don't necessarily have the knowledge about what they should be learning and they're not uh, oriented well in terms of what actual skills they should be looking for. So with that redistribution, I mean, my, my social democratic answer to that would be obvious. Uh, the state will finance a free educational system, which will give them an opportunity to study. Uh, and we have a labor market system like in Scandinavia, which uh, feeds you the knowledge about which part of the economy needs more people and what sort of skills are needed. That works well in not only in Scandinavia, but in Germany, Austria, much of Western Europe, this sort of a system works well. But I'm curious about your alternative. So how would a libertarian organize the upgrading of skills in a country like Hungary today? Right. The key thing to understand about skills is that normally people learn them on the job. Now, what that means is that you actually need to have companies that are higher. You know, so if you want to upgrade your skills, you need to have companies in your country where people are there that have the skills that you, that you actually want people to learn. And for that, I'd say the really obvious thing is, you, is that the skills that you're lacking exist in other countries already. The international corporations, multinationals, much hated, much despised. Nevertheless, they actually are the pathway to prosperity, the pathway to modernization. Um, now, I don't know a lot about Hungarian law about foreign investment, so you're in the EU, so at least for EU companies, there's prob it's probably fairly easy to do, although you also have a lot of corruption in favor of domestic, politically connected, uh, connected businesses, so I don't know how bad it is. But anyway, you know, step one is to make it very clear that you know, that in a multi, you know, international business is extremely welcome, there will be no, you know, they'll, they'll, there will be no difference in the treatment they receive, that uh, the, of course, they will be able to build skyscrapers. We know so always to work in the skyscrapers. So if you want to go and build a business district here, we would be super happy to have you do that. So you know, these are these are the kinds of things that I would think of as the, as the way that you really upscale a population is by getting the, the businesses where the skills are already known, and then this way they can go and teach the skills, which of course are not just technical skills. A lot of the really important skills for productivity are managerial skills of understanding the best way to organize, as well as just business connections. Uh, there's been some you know, great. There's been great work on managerial equality around the world done by some very mainstream economists, John Van Reed and Nicholas Bloom. Uh, one of the uh, one of the big results they have is that the richer the country, the better the management, right? And you know, me measured not in some definitional sense, but very basic things like good managed, well managed firms are ones where there's pay for performance. You keep track of inventory. You are trying you know, paying attention to new technological developments. These kinds of things. Right. Richer countries have better managed firms. Hungary, I think, they, I think they might actually be in their data set. I'm not sure, but I think they are. Would be in the middle. And then you know, poor countries uh, generally you know, wind up having very poorly managed firms, a lot of nepotism. Uh, but then they find a very important exception. And uh, well, actually, there's two exceptions. So one exception is state managed firms, which are just terrible everywhere by their standards. Uh, so that a libertarian point made by very non-libertarian researchers. But the other one is that multinational corporations work at a first world level around the world. Multinational corporations in third world countries and in, uh, and in um, mid-income mid countries work at a first world level, which means that they are not only providing higher quality management, but they are also educating people, learning by doing in the, kind, in the way that well-managed firms are actually managed. Uh, so this, I'd say, is what you really need to do if you want to upskill your workforce is make Hungary a beacon for multinational corporations so that they will come here and teach you how it's done. Okay, interesting that you say that. Um, the reason why it's interesting that you say that is because if you lived in Hungary, you would know that this is actually what we've done in the last 30, 40 years. So when we had transition from mm -hmm. state socialism to capitalism, mm -hmm. Uh, whereas everyone else in the region was trying to privatize to the inside mm -hmm. and create a sort of domestic ownership class, 
uh, Hungary from the middle of the 1980s was already trying to privatize mm -hmm. the foreign multinationals, which was actually followed by everyone else. So the entire region effectively mm -hmm. followed the Hungarian model. And we are extremely saturated by multinational firms. And in the last 30, 40 years, I think there's quite strong agreement on this. We have favored multinationals to the detriment of the local domestic uh, small and medium sized sector. So uh, we have done exactly what you're prescribing here. What is the outcome? The outcome is the following. Take the example of some, you know, one dominant sector in Hungary today, and, and we are relying on multinationals to a much larger degree than almost anyone else in the world. So we would be like in the top 10 globally in terms of relying on multinationals. One dominant sector is the, uh, the automobile sector. What, the what? Automobile sector, cars, oh, 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 cars. Oh, oh. What, what happens, if, that you could take mm -hmm. electronics, you mm -hmm. could take anything, uh, but take cars. What happens is you have a German car manufacturer will remain nameless. There are three big ones in Hungary now. Uh, where they have their headquarters in Germany, and they have their production plants in Hungary. Mm -hmm. and the reason why they've come here is because wages here are one third of German wages. Uh, trade unions almost non don't exist. Libertarian mm -hmm. dream paradise here. Uh, <laughs> environmental regulations are very lax. Once again, libertarian dream paradise here. Uh, taxes are much lower. Effectively, multinationals hardly pay any taxes in Hungary. Uh, so we've done everything which would be like a wet dream of a libertarian. What is the end result of all of that? The reason why multinationals are here is they are trying to exploit the low wages and the lax regulatory environment. Where are the high value added jobs? In Germany. Who, where do they create the technology? In Germany. Where are financial services? In Germany. So in the, value sh in the global value chains, all the, all the uh, high value added jobs remain in the headquarters of the multinational firm and they come here to exploit the low end of the same value chains. And if you try to upgrade, you, there's no way of relying on these multinationals because this is not simply not in their interest to do so. It is their interest to be here because of what they are here for. It is their interest to keep the high-end jobs where they come from. So that, for, that form of modernization has been proved in the last 30, 40 years not to be fruitful. Right. So two things. Uh, what is, I am aware there are multinational corporations in Hungary. Mm. I've walked around. I've seen them. Mm. Right. Uh, I'm almost sure you can do a lot more. Anytime there's a country where they say we've done as much as possible, when I look into it, like, there's a lot more you could do. Right, so I was just hearing yesterday, so like the richest man in Hungary is um, Orban Crony, correct? Who's he? Yeah. Well, what's his name? Lurins. But why? Yes. Why? Why? Right, is so, that, like, like is, is he is he run a multinational corporation? Or how, what, is that, how is that relevant? Yes. If you have, it, 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 right, it is a sign that you have not done nearly as much as you could in welcoming multinationals. So how uh, how is it? That wait, a, so what yes, would be yes, your, so unless yeah. all of the all of the economy is yes. multinational, we yes. haven't done enough. Look, look. Okay. Or where, where, yes. where is that? As, lo as long as there is any government favoritism towards domestic friends of the regime, that would be a sign. But as a, but again, but again, as it, long as a multinational wants to build skyscrapers in Hungary and you say, no, we're preserving our historic buildings, you haven't done enough. Um, now, I also say it's worth pointing out, Hungary has, done so, has improved fantastically in the last 30 years. You don't hear it very much, but yes, you know how much things have improved. And yes, those multinationals are a very large part of why things are so much better. And the ingratitude is so high oh, okay. towards okay. them. Oh, that's they're so exactly. terrible. They're exploiting well, that's, us. Okay. They came and they offered opportunity. Uh, and yes, they wanted to make money. Guess who else wants to make money? Yeah, Anyone Brian, who invests Brian, in the business. Brian, Brian, we know this. We know this. We, what you're saying now is exactly what you hear from, uh, from libertarians in Hungary. Mm -hmm. That, well, oh, in the big scheme of things, we've done well. We've improved mm -hmm. them. You know, Obviously, in absolute mm -hmm. terms, we are probably we have a higher GDP mm -hmm. than we did 30 years ago. But probably, no, but we do. We do uh, obviously. <laughs> definitely, but, but in relative, but in relative yeah. terms, the the point is, if you compare our development path in the last 30, 40 years to countries which have had a different variety of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I always use the Far East as an example. Mm -hmm. You have places like Taiwan, you have places like Singapore, Japan, now there's China, etc., where they have relied predominantly on domestic enterprise and not on foreign direct investment. 
they have done fantastically. So if you look at, for example, Singapore, which came from what being one of the, you know, the, the, the poorest countries in the world, which overtook the United States by 1982, so within a generation, they, and Hungary stayed pretty much where it was. So if you look at Hungary 100 years ago, it was a little bit above global average. During communism, we were a little bit above global average, and today we're a little bit above global average. So we basically stayed in a global comparison. We always stayed where we were. You take, you take a look at places like Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, uh, China today, where they have relied on domestic firms, they had their own multinationals, their Samsungs, their Daewoo's, their uh, 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 Panasonic's, their ZTE's and Huawei's, etc. They have done a lot better. So it's all, you know it's just completely different the scale of improvement in those countries and places like Hungary. Yeah, so they have done better. Let's note that two of those countries, Hong Kong and Singapore, were complete free trade countries. They, they get the highest scores in the I world know, for free trade. I didn't trade. mention Hong Kong, yes. but we could have right. the Hong Kong debate yes. too, but uh, I never mentioned so, Hong Kong. Uh, now, Singapore, I would be quite surprised if they did not have a higher multinational share than Hungary does. When you're there, you'll see that multinationals are everywhere there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, there are very important differences between, uh, you know, so, like, so it is true, so Singapore did have a larger role for government than Hong Kong, definitely, mm -hmm. although there's a very important difference between Singapore and Taiwan or South Korea or Japan, which is that Singapore, when they created state firms, they're always careful to say, we are not going to protect you from foreign competitors. We're still going to allow multinationals to be here. You're on your own. We're not going to bail you out. And I say that's probably a big part of how Singapore was able to make government industries work. Unlike, uh, unlike almost any, you know, much better than almost any other country, where they really did say you are going to have to go uh, have to pass the, the market test in the same uh, in the way that you didn't have to do some other countries. And the reason why yes. I didn't yeah. they didn't mention Singapore, uh, didn't mm -hmm. mention Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and Singapore in this sense is a problematic one as well because both of these mm -hmm. are effectively tax havens. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is a place mm -hmm. where effectively mm -hmm. Chinese mm -hmm. capital mm -hmm. escaped to once uh, communism came to China. So Hong Kong mm -hmm. is a much more complicated story than you know Milton mm -hmm. Friedman would have mm -hmm. us believe. It's far away from a sort of libertarian model but let's put that aside because it's really far away from our topic today so if I say let's leave Hong Kong and Singapore out because you'll take us too much time but but what South Korea uh, Taiwan Japan uh, China today I, I I hope you would not dispute the fact that these are state-driven developmental states and if you compare those states to Hungary they have done far better than we've done in the last 30 40 years not having relied on multinational capital right so they did rely on multinational capital and again if you look at the relative performance so again, if we just think of these as a, as a, as a cluster of countries Right. Hong Kong and Singapore are the two free market are, the, are, 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 are you know, much no, more free market than then, then, not, maybe not than Hungary, but, 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 then, but, then, but then those others. Right. You know, you know, here's what we really have is a case where the Asian Tigers did great. Yeah. Right now, as to which ones did better and worse, you can say is there was a wide range of government and government role in those Asian Tigers, and the ones that were that were more free that were more market than the others seem to do at least as well as the others. So in terms of the way, what it's supposed to prove, I don't see what the difference is. Okay, that's Mina, well, if we want to go to Europe, yeah. most people say okay. Poland was more free market than Hungary. We'd They've done better to, than you. We'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to have the uh, data here, and uh, yes. uh, I will. Yeah, that, is, uh, that is correct. It is I, hard I, to have a data argument without yes. data. At this point, we would need the data. So I suggest an alternative route. Uh, let's uh, start again from the bottom up. As I mentioned, about four fifths of Hungarian households do not have the savings. You're saying that the way to upgrade their skills is to let multinationals train them in house on the job. But a lot of people would say, well, out of that four fifths of society, probably two fifths are simply unemployable. And as I say, I say this as a left winger, they are unemployable in the sense that they have lost their uh, long term mental hygiene, they have lost their connection to the labor market, they would not be employed by uh, multinationals. And the reason why we know that is exactly because we've brought in so many multinationals, and I've personally done empirical studies on this. The only part of the country where multinationals actually employ people, uh, we have labor shortage in this country. We have a very severe labor shortage. At the same time, there are huge parts of the country where multinationals do not go because simply the human capital there 
is irrelevant for them. They go to larger towns, they go to wherever the highways are, uh, but they do not go to the majority of, uh, uh, of the territory of Hungary, and it would never be a solution to the employability of those people in those areas that you would just allow multinationals. They would not mm -hmm. employ those people. So wait, what is the state role of, uh, 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 and the multinational in agriculture in Hungary, by the way? The entire agriculture of Hungary is about 3% of uh, GDP. Ah. So. So, so even though you have large agricultural areas, but... Which is hmm. the same as in the States. You have yeah, large yes, agricultural yes, yes. areas in yes. the States, but mm -hmm. the overall employment right. uh, uh, ratio or the overall okay. GDP mm -hmm. ratio is minute. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so anyway, that, that was just a yeah. back, background yeah. question. Yeah. Again, uh, I have to say that I find it totally implausible that 80% of Hungarians have zero savings. This goes against a great book, Portfolios of the Poor, looking at third world countries where even among the, ver the ver world's very poorest people, almost everyone actually has savings and almost no one on earth lives day to day. There's you you, you may be talking about uh, unbanked as opposed to no, lack no, no, of no, savings. No, 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 no. There is this international yes. uh, survey. It's uh, in Hungary. It's done by a mm. firm called GFK Hungaria, mm. but this is an international survey mm. where they look at uh, they've measured that the average time it takes to find a job is about one and a mm. half years in the world, and they ask people how many people in Hungary you mean no, 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 all no, over the, the world, world in the world, all over the world, mm. uh, and they ask people, and they have this questionnaire in the states. They have it mm. in lots of countries around the world to find the, a formal sector job or. Uh, the question yeah. is, do you have savings enough to last you one ah. and a half years okay. while well, you well, are... That's very different from having no savings, isn't it? Yeah, but that's... Yeah. that's, that's like night, and, night and day, really. Yeah, yeah. But, but look, if you want an education, you would have to have that size of savings. So if uh -huh. you would want to enroll in a, you know, mm -hmm. a, 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 a paid university or secondary mm -hmm. school or something, that and in the meantime try to survive on something, mm -hmm you would have to have those kinds of savings. So I think it's yeah. a relevant question. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that is a bizarre interpretation of having no savings. No savings mean you have no bank account, no money in your wallet. Yeah, I mean, well, that, yeah, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm shocked that 20% of people would have one and a half years worth of savings, unless you're counting housing and everything and, and other, and other, and other assets. Housing. Right, so again, like no, honestly, what I would that. advise a person there is, you no, know, don't go and save up and go to school. Get a job and, and 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 learn by doing, which is the way that almost everybody actually arises in the world is learning by doing. Um, you know, like like it really is the case that in the United States, about thirty percent of people who even finish college end up without a college type job, and it was a total waste of time for them to be there. Uh, for people like that, it really would have been much better for them to go and set their sights lower, get a regular job, you know, even, and then go and work your way up, which really is the way the world works. Okay. Even, even working at McDonald's. Okay. I know, like, I know, I know this, I know, months, I know this argument. Yes. So the, the, you hear yeah. this argument a lot from libertarians. If you have a shitty job, uh, mm -hmm. Try to get an education and get a better yeah. job. Or, uh, well, I'm saying, get, no, no, if you have a shitty job, we're, stay there, work hard, yeah. look for something yeah, better, yeah, and yeah. rise. Okay, okay. The problem with that argument, I find, is that you're not assuming that that shitty job shouldn't be done by someone. If, if mm -hmm. your friend moves on and gets a better mm -hmm. job, someone still has mm -hmm. to do that shitty job. So mm -hmm. that shitty job is still there. That's mm -hmm. the problem, that you get jobs where you're actually incredibly underpaid for mm -hmm. terrible jobs, and you mm -hmm. do know that a lot of people get mm -hmm. stuck in these jobs. So the, 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 it's, it's simply, you can't have mm -hmm. everybody move up. It's just mathematically impossible that everybody moves up and nobody does those shitty jobs. So somebody's got to do those. It can be a life cycle issue where young people get the worst jobs and then they graduate and guess who replaces them? The next generation of young people. This is life. Yes, what is, your first job is not going to be good. How could it be? You don't know anything. The point of a first job is to learn basic things like show up on time, don't yell at the customers, do what you're told. And once you learn that, then you can rise, and then your job, then your job is filled oh, by another person who doesn't know that okay, yet because they are a couple okay, years younger than okay. you. We have a system of, um, okay, uh, let me bring you this example. There was an article not so long ago in a Hungarian newspaper. It's an interview with a Roma kid from mm -hmm. the east of Hungary who was getting the best marks in school possible. So mm -hmm. it was like full A's in uh, your system, full fives mm -hmm. in our system. Uh, perfect student. He was interviewed, I remember, if I remember, he was about 16 or so. Mm -hmm. He was interviewed by journalists um, asking him what would be your dream job uh, if you were to have any job that you would imagine. And his answer was, I wish I could work on a construction site. 
That was mm -hmm. his answer. Uh, now, uh, if you ask a kid in the second district of Budapest, which is the elite district in mm -hmm. Hungary here, what, you know, somebody is doing terribly at school, what is your uh, dream job or what sort of job do you expect in life? Their sort of minimal answer would be that my, fa my parents have a, a firm that I'm going to take over and I'm going to continue, you know, l leading that firm. So the kind of, even at the point of... That would be the minimum answer? Yeah, that would be the minimum answer. I mean, they how would... How rich is this district? It is very rich. It is it is a it is a it is the richest district yeah, of I mean, Budapest. So m most people there have private firms, and their parents will leave, you know will they will inherit those those private firms. So what is the justice in a East Hungarian Roma kid having their sights at a construction site, which is probably where they see themselves uh, at most? in 10 years time whereas a l much worse performing kid from the from an elite family having their sights you know basically the the sky is the limit so the least i will do the, the worst i can do is to go on with my parents firms and the upper limit is the sky what is the libertarian answer to that those sort of chances of life when you say okay you have to start at the bottom but surely you're not saying everyone starts at the bottom a lot of people do not start at the bottom hmm. so of course first of all i would start by saying people at the bottom are actually people who don't get to be born in a country like hungary so people that would or would be desperate to migrate with hungary would be the people we should really think of as being at the bottom uh, just to put things in perspective uh, in terms of your stories, I would say that you are deliberately choosing the most extreme endpoints in order to paint an emotional picture. Uh, it would be much better to go and look at the actual correlation of intergenerational income. So, you know, so usual estimates of that for country. So I do. I don't know about Hungary. So usual estimates of the correlation between parent and son income at similar times in life is only about 0.3. We have uh, the worst yes. social mobility yes. in the entire OECD. Hungary right. has the worst okay. social And the uh, United States yes. also has terrible social mobility. So, hmm. well, then you can't be much, you know, so then you would be similar where, to us. Where, do, where, yes. where, yes. uh, where do we have effective social mobility? Mm -hmm. In Scandinavia. Yes. Um, yeah. hmm. that, that's a fact. Yes. That's so, fact. let's see. Uh, but, well, we'll come, we can come back to that perhaps. We'll, yeah, we'll so, so just starting, you know, but, you know, like, so like, if, you, if you've got an intergenerational uh, you know, you know, income correlation of 0.3, what this shows you is actually the, predict, the ability of parent income to predict child income is actually quite low. And in absolute terms, there's a lot of mobility, even in countries that you say are are, are the worst. It's easy so, to check, yes. Brian. It's easy yes. to check. It's easy mm -hmm. to check. Social mobility yes. figures in, for yeah. the OECD are mm -hmm. available. Yeah, the so best, some countries are worse than others. Best, all best, all actually are amazingly the best, good. The best levels of social mobility are in countries with a welfare state, and the worst levels mm -hmm. of social mobility are countries without a welfare mm -hmm. state, such as Hungary. Hmm. Uh, possibly. I mean, of course, there's, the uh, yeah, yes, you know, the of course you know, there's also the possibility that the, that the kids from rich families are actually really great. Worth considering. Yeah, but that's yes. that's the same kind yes. of argument. Yes. You know, when you have yes. a when you have mm -hmm. an Olympic sports mm -hmm. team, yeah, uh, do you just send the kids of your Olympic athletes to the mm -hmm. next Olympics? You should not be surprised if the, the kids of Olympians become Olympians themselves or assume that but some, they, something evil is going on. But they don't. For yes. the most part, they don't. Yes. We um, have we have yeah. national selections, mm -hmm. and we tend to send mm -hmm. very different people to Olympics than previous yes. Olympics. Olympics. Yeah. So I mean, stepping back, what I would say is that these are the kinds of questions that this book <laughs> that this book is designed to get people to stop worrying about. Like, it is the real injustice in the world is that some people get born in rich countries, some get born in poor countries. And if you're born in a poor country, you really are stuck, and your odds of ever being able to migrate and get a job in a rich country are, are very low. Mm. This problem of within rich countries, you might be born in a poor family and then you will be at a, at a relatively low level rich country is just a distraction. Like the, uh, the injustice of the world caused by immigration restrictions is so much greater. And it's something that really all people should be able to agree on. Libertarian, mm. socialists, we should mm. all agree it's not fair that if just because mm. you're born in Bangladesh, you are not able to go and work in a construction site in Hungary. Mm. And honestly, I would say, like, until we've opened the borders, why are we even talking about this? Okay. Why is that? So why is it like, and again, because 
because it's people emotionally care a lot more about inequality within their country than what really matters, which is inequality between countries. Okay, now, the, the, the bad news is that we're running out of the time I devoted to our little discussion mm -hmm. here, the two of us, but I would like to leave the uh, leave right. some time for the, uh, the audience to ask questions as well. Um, Please, somebody ask him about skyscrapers, because <laughs> I, I, I didn't have the time, and uh, it's obvious that he, he, he'd like to talk about it. Um, it. Yeah, so questions, please, from the audience. If you have any. Anything at all? So what yeah. yeah. Oh. So what about the skyscrapers? What about <laughs> skyscrapers? <laughs> Well, you had a question. Uh, how would you tackle a global problem like climate change from a libertarian perspective? Right. I mean, how would you tackle it from a status perspective? There's really no easy. There's you know, like very little sign that anything along these lines, that anything much was going to happen. Uh, there's a lot of hope that maybe if rich countries do it, then poor countries will go along. I don't think that's very likely at all. Uh, I'd say fortunately there actually is a really cheap alternative to cutting back on, on uh, fossil fuel emissions. And this is something called geoengineering. Um, long story short, again, this is not like a weird eccentric view. This is like, like you can go and read the Wikipedia article. This is very mainstream science, which says there's actually a very cheap way of offsetting the warming effects with the relatively cheap introduction of sulfur dioxide into higher levels of the atmosphere. It basically is a way of artificially generating a volcano. Um, so anyway, this is something where it really would take almost no money in order to do it. Uh, it's something that the main argument the scientists will give against it actually is it's so cheap that it's going to get us to not do the hard thing. Um, now there's something else that I'm a big fan of which is nuclear power. So this is something which again is a way that countries could switch over to nuclear power and which has no carbon emissions. Um, on it, it, it is, is a way for a country to improve the environment while also getting cheap energy while also not helping Putin. Uh, so it's uh, and also super safe, put it all together. Um, yeah, as, I mean, as, yes, we just yes, saw, yes. as we just saw in the Ukraine with uh, <laughs> Chernobyl, Zaporozhye, mm -hmm. um, yes. Other questions? It is true if paratroopers capture your nuclear plants, you have some problems. We I just had, a, we just had mm -hmm. a, a drone uh, fly past our nuclear power station undetected mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. uh, explosives mm -hmm. on it uh, a week ago. No, mm -hmm. one ev no one even noticed that this thing flew over Hungary. Other questions? Actually, I have a question for you, if, if that's allowed. Uh, what is your view on removing immigration restrictions and opening borders? Um, economically speaking, I would be all for it. Um, so there's, that's another reason why I didn't want to debate it, because I, I, um, I don't have any economic reasons against it. Some countries need it more than others. So I think, for instance, uh, Places like Sweden or Germany definitely have a need for uh, immigrant labor. Hungary, not so much. I think we still have huge reserves of uh, the population who are not working in Hungary and who could be mobilized to work. So economically speaking, we, we, we are not one of those countries which but you need. you said that they are unemployable. Um, they are unemployable by the multinational sector, but they're not unemployable locally. So I think if you were creating jobs locally with cooperatives with uh, small and medium size I mean, one problem with this model that we've had is we've biased we were biased all the way through towards multinationals so if we gave a chance to hungarian domestic uh, small and medium sized enterprises we could employ a lot more people in those parts of the country where multinationals don't employ people uh, so in theory i'm not against it uh, but there seems to be a lot of cultural uh, cultural enmity against it. So the problem is that however much it would make sense or not from an economic point of view, the decisive factor I fear will never be an economic argument. The, de the, the decisive factor will be the kind of cultural biases that people have. And Hungary is the one country in the EU with, the, I think, the strongest cultural biases against certain immigrants from certain parts of the world. So. Uh, not so much about Ukrainians. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah we'll, ha we'll have to see that. But uh, uh, it, it seems to be that Hungarians are much more open to 
people coming from sort of Western Christian uh, cultures than from especially the Middle East. Uh, so I, I, I fear that the decisive factor here is you know, whatever arguments economists have, pro, pro or against, the decisive factor will be a cultural uh, factor and not so much an economic argument. My question regarding the uh, FDI's invest uh, FDI investments in, in domestic countries, like uh, foreign direct investments, and uh, also these uh, international companies coming to Hungary, for example, because they say that it has a spillover effect on the domestic uh, firms' productivity and domestic firms, but there is empirical evidence that they, it, it can only be uh, useful if the country has the human resources and also an institutional quality. And this too is also, uh, so the human capital is based on education, and the institutional quality is based on the quality of the government. So if we have international companies, but we don't have the, the human capital to absorb this, this spillover effect, then how can we improve the efficiency of, of the, the whole economy? Hmm. I guess I'm not sure I understand the question. I think what it's yeah. uh, what it's saying is the order of things. So mm -hmm. you, you you believe mm -hmm. that multinationals will improve those things, mm -hmm. and what I, I think, if I understand yeah, you yeah. correctly, mm -hmm. what you're saying mm -hmm. is that these things mm -hmm. are sort of prerequisites for multinational mm -hmm. firms to come to. Right. So I would just say it's very hard to understand how traditional academic education, largely irrelevant to the real world, gets a country ready to be improved by multinationals. So, again, I don't know the Hungarian education system, I know the American one. The idea that you need to go and spend three years not learning a foreign language, and then spend three years not learning history, and three years not learning civics, and three years not learning science, and then you emerge and you're ready to be improved by multinational. To say, look, the causation really just does not make sense to me. Uh, so to say, like, we need to invest more in education, have a lot more people to go to college, and then they'll be able to go and receive the benefits the multinationals have to offer seems uh, very impossible. But if I, may, if, yeah. if I may support the uh, argument behind the, the question, um, if you look at the uh, it's volumes of international flows of foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. you don't have massive amounts of money going to uh, low-end, mm -hmm. uh, low-tax, uneducated societies mm -hmm. like Bulgaria, sorry mm -hmm. to pick on Bulgaria, but they are probably the, mm -hmm. the, the best example of such a country. And if you contrast that to Denmark, you always find this is a long-term trend that a lot more foreign direct investment goes to countries where the human capital is already higher, which was created by an efficient state uh, uh, educational system and state healthcare system, you have massively more uh, FDI flowing into those countries that those countries, which in your theory, would need it the most. How do you respond to that? Right. So there's a large work in international development where they try to measure the effect of education on growth. The people that do this research very desperately want to find a large effect of, of education on growth. And they spent several decades and had a lot of trouble finding it. So while it may seem anecdotally that countries that have high education are the ones that then develop, it seems like it's coincidence and there's but a lot Brian, of other, no, there's, no, there's once a again, lot of other Brian, yes, Sorry, this, yes. is, this is just, uh, once again, you're homogenizing the profession. Yes. There are authors who say this, there are instances where you find that, but there are other instances where you yes. find massive, massive... So uh, here, here's what I'll say, I did a full literature search and I, and I was expecting that I would find mm. what you said, mm. and I was pleased to find the opposite. Mm. That actually it was very hard to find anyone who was work doing empirical development. Of course, there's all sorts of non-empirical people who say education's great. You write a paper for the World Bank saying, oh, we have to do more for education. And, um, that's not research. Research is where you have like actu actual econometric work, where you're really trying to go and test, uh, test the story and find the effect. And yeah, I, it was quite shocking that, uh, that to me that uh, you were able to find so little. And this on top of the fact that there, you know, even if you did find it, there is an obvious uh, other story, which is reverse causation, namely that countries get rich and then they spend a lot of money on education, which we can see very clearly in the real world. You know, you know, you know, just imagine if a country were to get a very large windfall, what are the odds they would spend none of it on education? 
right? Of course, it's, it's the kind of thing that people, that countries want to spend money on in order to show how wonderful they are and how much, the, how they have their priorities, right? But anyway, um, you know, like, you know, like say, um, You'll be, again, like, so like, like if you go to my book, I go through all of the main sites, mm -hmm. and again, I don't think that I missed anything important. So it's like, like, mm -hmm. I'll, basically, like, like there, there's one paper where, uh, you know, they they basically revised the data as much as they could, and they still didn't get a result, and then they revised it one more time, and then they said, all right, if we do further revisions, then maybe we can squeeze out this effect. But it doesn't seem to be, but again, like this, and again, this is not weird libertarian economists. This is like normal middle of the road development economists saying, gee, we were, we're so sure that develop, that education causes development, but we're having trouble finding in the data. Mm, yeah, I think it's more complicated. Other questions? Yeah, we said, what about the skyscrapers? So what about um, yeah. the skyscrapers? <laughs> we, we won't leave this place without you telling us about the skyscrapers, however Freudian that might be. So, you know. What um, is it about the skyscraper? Yes. One of the main regulations that exists on Earth that prevents further development is regulation of building heights. In Budapest, you obviously have very strict regulations. So what did you say that the tallest building in Budapest is 20 stories? 20. Yeah, we yeah, just so yeah. we have one big penis now, which is being built yes. across the Danube. But right. apart from that, we have like almost no yes. high 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 rise right. buildings. In and the so I don't know the numbers for Hungary, but almost any other country that you look at, what you'll see is that if you have a downtown of this kind, yes. a historic one that pe the people that that is uh, famous around the world for tourism, that if you just go and look at the cost of building a skyscraper and the pure cost of the land that it would be incredibly profitable to go and build skyscrapers, which would then lead to an abundance of housing, both for residential, commercial, and so on, leading to a large reduction in price, so that it would be much more affordable, and yet the regulation says it is illegal to do so. All right, this is very true in San Francisco, for example, which has, uh, you know, basically the price in San Francisco is now at about 10 times the cost of production. This is physical cost of production, so the cost of just the raw land and the building but the regulation there is a, such a, uh, it's not just handcuffs, it's like a full Houdini outfit where you are completely surrounded in regulation that prevents you from going and building, right? And you know, if you go to Warsaw, for example, there you'll see a lot of skyscrapers. Anyway, this is something the government does which greatly raises the price of a basic necessity of housing. Uh, so uh, the guy, I think I was looking at prices of downtown dwellings in Budapest. It looked like it was like half a million dollars for an apartment in the good area. Is that about right? Yes. yes. All right. And you know, this is something that is caused by government. If government would just say, fine, you can build skyscrapers. Right now, you might be worried, oh, if we build skyscrapers, tourists wouldn't come anymore. They're still going to come. Right, don't worry. In fact, it would probably, I think tourists would say, wow, it's, it combines the old and the new. Yeah. So much great stuff going on here. Oh. Well, yeah. Brian, why uh, not? If you're here for a couple of days more, Barbara should take you to Margaret Bridge. Uh, <laughs> we have a picture in our passports uh, of Budapest from uh, Margaret Bridge, looking at mm -hmm. Budapest mm -hmm. from Margaret Bridge. You have on the left side, you have the Pest area with the parliament building. We have the Danube in the middle. We have the hills of Buda on the right side. Uh, really beautiful. That's the reason why we have that picture in our passports. Now, recently they've built a uh, one, the one skyscraper mm -hmm. that we have, which is bang in the middle of that picture. Uh, so you have this historical landscape, which is a large part of the reason why people do come to Budapest. With that in the middle, which there is no part of Budapest now from where you cannot see it. Mm -hmm. And you would be hard pressed to find anyone in Budapest who actually likes that building now. Yeah. Well, that's the problem is that you are basing policy upon an emotional reaction rather than looking at what is the effect on the price. Yes, we are. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> so what if you could get the price of housing down by 50%? Yes, we are, Brian. Right. We have an emotional yes, attachment yes, to Budapest. Yes, yes. Sorry to say. And, well, here, let me tell you. If, you. if you listen to me, we build a ton of skyscrapers. In 20 years, people have an emotional attachment to new Budapest. Mm. It's very easy to adjust. The people in Warsaw are not going around saying, oh my God, our city is so horrible. Instead, they're happy with what they got. And what do you get? What do you get in addition? You get cheap housing. You don't have to live with your parents for your whole life. You can afford to have some room, right? That's what that, that's what we're talking about. 
And, you know, and by the way, of course, like, like, you could also just put it to yellow. Like, even in Paris, where they have very strict regulation, they do have a skyscraper district off to the side. Even they, with all their, fra of their famous French stubbornness, have still bent and allowed skyscrapers to be built off in another corner of the city. You, you said, like, there's nowhere around here. Like, none, none in the whole country, right? I don't think so. So, no, but there's other problems we have the there. technology to build there's, skyscrapers. There's a lot of we other totally issues should. as well. Yeah. We have, yes. uh, you know that Budapest in the Roman times used to be pretty much uh, the, the mod uh, of, uh, of the Danube. So we used to have an area here which was like Amsterdam. We used to have canals all over Pest. So effectively most of Pest is mud underneath. It's, it's uh, the, the, the fluvial residue of the Danube. So it's actually very hard to build skyscrapers on that sort of soil. So is that ugly building going to collapse? Uh, uh, I hope so, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we are out of time. I don't see more questions uh, anywhere. If you do, right. obviously, I'm sure Brian will answer them. All right. uh, well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's a lot thank of fun. You. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for coming. Thank you.